Ecuador prepares for eruption of glacier-covered volcano. Now this is a very interesting article. Ecuador contains one of the densest concentrations of volcanoes on the planet. At last count, 84 volcanic centers straddle the Andes Mountains, which run through the country north to south. As many as 24 of those volcanoes are potentially active, and some are covered in glaciers, which compound the threat of an eruption with the addition of ice and glacier debris. A history of major eruptions and recent volcanic activity, including on the glaciated stratovolcano Cotopaxi, has unnerved Ecuadorian citizens and prompted government action. On April 19th, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, or IFRC, issued an early action protocol to ameliorate the health, livelihood, and food scarcity impacts of ash fallout from volcanic eruptions on Ecuadorian communities. The EAP is the result of a project spearheaded by the German Red Cross to coordinate forecast-based financing to reduce the impact of extreme natural disasters in 20 countries, Ecuador was selected to receive support for a volcanic ash fallout plan. This is from August 17, 2015. This is a picture of Cotopaxi spewing ash. So then they go into what happens, how it affects the livelihood, and it doesn't have to be full bore exploding. Um, to affect the livelihood, it can just be a little bit of ash. The phases of early action for ash fall depend on the depth of forecasted ash deposition, distribution of health protection kits for ash fall between 2 and 5 millimeters, a livelihood protection package to protect livestock, and harvested crops from ash fall between 5 and 10 millimeters, and the addition of cash based incentives for ash fall greater than 10 millimeters. Those poor horses. So, anyway, it goes on. Ash fall from eruptions can have a significant health and economic impacts for downslope communities. In previous events of ash fall, people have had to transport their animals to safe areas free from ash fall, or have had to sell their cattle up to 70% less than the normal commercial value, generating a negative impact on household economies. In other cases, their animals died, which led to a serious impact on their economic stability. In these cases, affected households had to resort to bank loans that they continue to be unable to repay. But it's not the lava or even the ash that worry those who live near glacier-clad Cotopaxi. It's the Lahar, a superheated, deadly slurry of mud, water, volcanic rock, ice, and other debris. Cotopaxi poses dramatically different hazards to nearby populations. When combined with hot ash and flowing rock, an eruption of a glaciated volcano can create a lahars, 
which are known to travel downhill at speeds of up to 200 kilometers per hour or 120 miles per hour. Ecuadorian government has installed eruption warning systems to alert communities in Lajar zones. The moment monitors detect seismic activity consistent with an eruption, automated sirens rouse communities downslope. Ecuador is the only country with glaciers straddling the equator. Though Ecuador is seldom thought of as a glacier country, so prominently do glaciers figure in the nation's landscape they even appear on its national flag. So I thought that was interesting. Lahars and they go really fast. So you got to get if you're going to get out of the way of that, you need an early warning system. And they have a lot of earthquakes and earthquakes go along with volcanoes. So there's that one. And then this one is from UPI.com. Earthquake location influenced by stress buildup of previous ruptures. This just came out. The fault slips that generate earthquakes release lots of stored energy. Energy that reverberates violently across the planet's crust. But earthquakes also create new stresses. New research suggests that accumulation of stress caused by historic earthquakes could explain why and where the next seismic event occurs. In regions vulnerable to earthquakes, major seismic events seem to occur at random, but new findings, published this week in the journal Nature Communications, suggest the static stress stored on a fault plane prior to rupture, so-called column pre-stress, can help explain historic and modern earthquake patterns. Until now, most models assume pre-stress is zero, but authors of the new study suggest such an assumption is flawed. The stress on a brittle fault plane is accumulated over centuries to millennia as a result of tectonic loading and a history of earthquakes. Through their analysis, scientists showed column pre-stress should not be ignored. Researchers used written accounts of historic earthquake damage, modern seismic data, and state-of-the-art modeling to show positive stress caused by a history of earthquakes is almost always present along faults prior to rupture. Earthquakes are caused by rocks sliding past each other along fault lines, which causes the forces and stress in the surrounding rocks to change after a big earthquake. It is often assumed that the nearest fault to a particular earthquake will be the next to rupture. The latest study showed that is rarely the case. According to Milden and her colleagues, current earthquake prediction models are over-reliant on column stress factor theory, CST, which describes the transfer of stress to surrounding material in the wake of a seismic event. The new study suggests cumulative stress, or historical stress, within fault systems is a better predictor of future earthquakes. Our model adds the stresses of lots of earthquakes together and shows that in the majority of cases fault lines are positively stressed when they rupture. It is a step change in modeling CST and shows this is an ignored yet vital factor when trying to explain earthquake triggering. Scientists arrived at their conclusions after studying the history of earthquakes in Italy's central Apennine 
Apennines region. When researchers tracked the location of earthquakes in the region over the last 700 years, they found 97% of the faults were wholly or partially stressed, boasting a positive column pre-stress prior to rupture. Earthquakes are hugely destructive to both people and property, and the holy grail of earthquake science would be to predict where they are going to happen and when. We are a very long way from that, and indeed it may never be possible to accurately predict the location, time, and size of future earthquakes. Our research, however, could be a starting point in helping us develop better forecasts of which fault lines might be more susceptible based on previous tremors. So there's the article. Well, they can also factor in volcanoes and sulfur dioxide release, I would think. But they stick to earthquakes. But I thought that was interesting. So what that means is the energy keeps building even though there's been an earthquake it means that it it stores up the energy and it creates new stressors right there on that fault tectonic loading accumulated over centuries to millennium. So this could be why we see the earthquakes in the same place over and over and over again. Because we're getting cumulative stresses. So, let's move on to earthquakes now. Oh, before that, we'll check our Oroville Dam levels. At 6 o'clock tonight, the lake level is at 895.68 feet. The inflow is 4938 CFS. The outflow is 4829 CFS. So it's gone up. Let's see how much it's gone up today. 895.68 minus. Okay, midnight. Oh, not much. 895.63. It's only gone up 0 0.05 today. So, but yesterday it went up 0 0.21 from midnight to midnight. So, we're going to keep an eye on that. Okay, now looking at USGS, we have 241 earthquakes of all magnitudes worldwide today in the last 24 hours. Of those, 32 are 2.5 magnitude or higher. So, see what's about to come off the map. If there's a 3.5 in Puerto Rico. Here's a 2.5 at Badger, Alaska. This this one's going off at 7:36. So we've got plenty of time. We can start wherever we want. I'd like to start right up here on this Arctic earthquake. just to the southwest of Svalbard 
A 4.6 in the Greenland Sea. This came in at 12.02 this afternoon. Now these are Pacific time. These times I'm telling you. Because that's my time zone. So does beaming cause earthquakes? I don't know why not. Because it's heating things up. Couldn't it heat up the magma? flowing couldn't it you know cause things to move I'm of the theory that it could then here's a rare earthquake in France a 4.3 near Fahirs France at 1150 last night very shallow 3.4 kilometers deep so that's that's probably not big enough to do damage, but they felt it. I would imagine they felt that. Next is a 4.2 near Twin Sang, India at 9.42 this morning. Then down here is a 4.6 near Sindangar Sindang Sorry, Indonesia at 327 this morning. There's a 4.1 in the North Mar Mariana Islands at 11.14 this morning. Deep, deeper than what we normally see, 299 kilometers deep. Next down here at Papua New Guinea, we've got a 5.3 near Candrian at 11.38 last night and a 4.7 near Kokopo at 3.14 this morning. So these were both on land. That 5.3 could have done some damage. I don't really know. But it was 51 kilometers deep. So It could have done damage. Then down here, we're going to look at this one at Tonga, a 5.0 at Ohonua Tonga at 4.34 this afternoon. And then these are aftershocks from that big 7.2 couple of days ago, still at Lesperance Rock in the Kermadec Islands. There was a 5.3 6.2 that's the largest one today. This one came in at 137 this morning. 5.0 5.1 and then the 5.1 that one came in at 4 o'clock this afternoon. So it's still rocking down there for whatever reason. Maybe it's splitting. Maybe it's starting to come apart down there. I don't know. That's just a thought that just came to me. I think that's all the international earthquakes. That was fast. Look, nothing in South America. So now we're going to go to all magnitudes. We're going to start down here in Hawaii. We've got four here today. Here's a 1.7 near Kilauea. 2.3 Kilauea. 1.7 Mauna Loa. And a 3.1 at Mauna Loa. And this one is, was at a negative 1.7 kilometers depth. So that was up in the crater. That one came in at 436 this afternoon. So that's happening. Now here in the Caribbean we've got 8 here today. We've got a 4.0 
near Puerto Rico at 522 this morning. That's the largest one. So I'll call these off. 3.5, 2.0, 1.0, 2.0, 2.0, 4.0, 2.7, 2.4, and 3.2. So, not big enough to do damage where, that, where they're located, but showing movement, and that 4.0 is getting up there. Now let's go to Alaska. We take a tour around the world with Margo at night. Okay, we've got 84 here today. All magnitudes. So, let's see what's 2.5 magnitude or higher. We've got 8 here. Here's a 3.8 at Bull Deer Island. Here's a 3.7 Gulf of Alaska, 2.5 Kodiak, 3.0 Anchor Point, 2.7 Redoubt Volcano, 3.3 Sterling, 2.7 Talkeetna, and a 2.5 at Badger. So let's zoom in and look at our little ones now around these islands. This is at Tananga Volcano, these little microquakes. Here we've got one at ADAC today, a minus one. This is where we saw those 33 yesterday. Two point two Atka. 2.3 Atka coming on up. Here's 3 at Unalaska. These are all microquakes. I don't know what's going on. Something. 2.3 Old Iliamna. Now I, this is this is Redoubt Volcano right along in here. So when you see Anchor Point, that's that's very near readout. Here's a 2.7, 1.3, there's our 3.0, 1.8, and so on, 1.9. So all of these are right at near readout volcano. There's that 3.3. Here's Anchorage. It's got a few here today. Not too many. And now we're seeing them moving on up through the middle of the state. Here's Fairbanks. So we're seeing kind of in a cluster around Fairbanks. Here's one at Koktovik, a 1.8. And at Kobuk today, we've got 12. These are ones and under. So we've got some in the little armpit here. Here's another ice quake, a 1.4 magnitude ice quake at Cape Yakutaga. And here's a 1.1 ice quake. Okay, now coming on down into the lower 48. We're showing 132 here today. Here in Oklahoma, we have eight. I'll call them off. 
There's a 1.3 Moreland, 2.9 Wycomus, 1.9 Wycomus, 1.9 Medford, 2.0 Moreland, 2.0 Hennessy, and a 1.8 and a 2.2 at Enid. So that is consistently showing activity there. Now coming on up, Utah is clear. Well, Yellowstone is very quiet. That's a little suspicious. There's a 0.6 at West Yellowstone and a 2.2 at Soda Springs, Idaho. It's always bothersome to see too few earthquakes somewhere. Just bothers me. Now in the Pacific Northwest, let's start with these. Oh my gosh. Well, let's let's come we'll go to those in a second. We've got up here in Washington and then we've got an explosion in Canada. So we've got seven here. So we've got some clustering it looks like. Here's this 1.9 magnitude explosion near Princeton, Canada. That happened at 2.20 this afternoon. Let's look at the tremor map. The latest data is from yesterday. And they're showing 77 tremors here from yesterday. And the majority of them are up here around the Seattle area. And then down here are a few near Olympia. But the majority of them are right up here. And we've seen them hanging around up there. So this is this is where this Cascadia subduction zone comes in and the tremors come in before you see the earthquakes. This is showing pre-earthquake movement. So we're going to get into that in a minute. So let's zoom in. We've got three here at Sutton Valley. 2.8, 2.1, and 1.9. And down here at Amboy, where'd it go? I'm lost. Here we go. This is at Mount St. Helens. We've got three here, right on the edge of the crater. Point one, point one, and a point two. This is the crater, huge crater. And this is, there's one right on the rim, and then these two are on the flank. Then, here's this subduction zone coming down, and we've got four earthquakes of note here. We've got, and this is the Juan de Fuca plate. This is the San Andreas fault line. So we've got this 4.2 at 10.23 last night on the edge of that Juan de Fuca plate. Here's a 3.2 at 3.03 this afternoon. Here's a 2.6 down here at this fulcrum point at 9.39 last night and a 2.1 right next to it at 4.49 this afternoon. So that's definitely showing movement 
could be showing the slippage, you know, who knows. And then in Northern California, here's a 1.8 at French Gulf. So let's see. Now this is right next to Mount Shasta, uh, Lake Shasta. It looks like just to the west of it. And here's the dam. So it's not very far from the dam at Shasta Lake. 1.8 and all these lakes are full, all these reservoirs are full, and they're not releasing any. And the snow's melting, so... I mean, it's, it's a huge concern when you see all of this. Then, coming on down, Here's a 1.4 Upper Lake, California. And then straight across, we've got a minus 0.2. This is at Mount Rose. And a 0.4 at Truckee. And then here's a, another one at Sun Valley, a 0.1. We saw 17 here yesterday. Down here by Carson City is a point seven. Here north of Walker Lake was a point one point one. Here at Hawthorne or Bridgeport. That's actually the Hawthorne area is a one point two. So that's eerily quiet down there. Let's see if anything is going on up north. Nope. And only one lone earthquake in southern Nevada. A point six at Pahrumpf. Now this is eerily quiet for Friday. Could it be something's going on because it's the summer solstice? I don't know. I seriously don't know. It is the longest day of the year for the Northern Hemisphere. So now let's look at Mammoth Lakes. We've got seven here today. These are ones and under. The biggest one is this 1.7 at Yo Yosemite Valley. There's a point three. Now coming into the Coso Junction area, we've got 12 here today. 2.2, 2.1, those are the larger ones, 2.1. The rest are mainly in the ones range. So that's still showing movement. Coming on down. Okay, we're getting into Southern California. Here's a 1.4 quarry blast at Adelanto. Here's a 1.2 quarry blast at Tehachapi. So in Southern California, we're seeing 36 on the map today. Let's see if any of those are two and a half or higher. Nope. We got... How did I miss that one? Uh, 2.6 at Freon. Anyway, it's on the other side of the mountains and from where I was showing. All right, so all of these down here are under two and a half magnitude. So that's kind of an average number. So let's just 
let's see where they're going on. Um, there's not a lot of clustering. It's just they're kind of scattered about. Now here's Glen Avon. If we zoom in one more, there are eight on the map here in the Glen Avon area. And the highest one is this 1.8 at Fontana. Then coming on over. That's it. Nothing west of that. That's like the line. The dividing line. Here's a 1.0 quarry blast at Home Gardens. That's it. Down here. Now, here's a 1.0 near Ojai. I think I got this one. Yep. Okay, let's come up this San Andreas fault line now. That's that. We got that at Kernville, 1.2. 1.9 Kettleman City. 1.1 Kalami. 1.5 San Ardo. Now this is that 2.6 at Freon. Here's a 1.0 pinnacles, 0.8 pinnacles. Here's a 0.9 Hollister. Here's a quarry blast right on the fault line. A 1.2 near Aromas. Here's another quarry blast next to the fault line. A 1.1 at Loyola. Then a 1.6 Boulder Creek, 0.8 Alum Rock, 1.5 Wesley. We got this one near Ukai, that 1.4. So let's see what's going on at the geysers. We've got 33 here today. So these are, <coughs> these are small, these are low ones and under. So that's kind of an average number for us to see. I think that's a wrap for the earthquakes.